Hey guys, it's Blair Ducanay. We're live from the compound today. Actually, it's the home edition of the compound because we are in the midst of the stay at home campaign for the coronavirus pandemic, but the world continues from home. And I have a special guest today, George Kinder, president and founder of the Kinder Institute for Life Planning, author of multiple books, including one of my favorites, Lighting the Torch, former financial planner, and as I like to call him, the father of the life planning movement. George Kinder, welcome to The Compound. Thanks, Claire. Awfully nice to be here with you uh, 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 digitally. Exactly. It's the new way of living in 2020. It is. It is. Um, well, George, first, could you define for us life planning? What is it? Um, life planning uh, uh, is, I mean, there are simple ways of describing it. One way to describe it that some people have said is that it's financial planning done right. Uh, but what it, it really is, is it's taking the first segment of a financial planning engagement and uh, and expanding it. Most people do questionnaires and uh, digital uh, and, and, and kind of coordinate people's responses to what their goals are. What life planning is, is it's a process that takes the client seriously and uh, seeks to discover through uh, authentic uh, relationship conversations, uh, what the client would aspire to most deeply, most profoundly, and what, what would give them the most energy and the most satisfaction in life. And then, having done that, uh, it inspires them to do that in short order, meaning certainly within three years, often within a month or two. And so there are dramatic changes that occur for a client who's been thinking that they'd hold something off till retirement that is really they're really passionate about. So we deliver people really into their dreams of freedom in short order, using then all the financial planning acumen that we have to make it happen. Wow, that sounds very powerful. And uh, you and I connected because I wrote a blog post called Curveball Clarity about your three questions. It's a technique that I have used personally on myself in retrospection, maybe not the way it's supposed to be done, but um, could you just explain your three questions and then t tell us kind of what you've learned over the years by asking these three questions to many, many people? Yeah, well, the the, the first question is just the, the simple, if you had all the money that you needed for the rest of your life, what, what how would you live, what would you do? So it gets the person to start fantasizing, and it's a fun question that most people are willing to answer that question. The second question you couldn't ask without asking the first question because it, it would feel too personal in a new relationship sometimes. Um, so the second question is, and, and you let them know that you're gonna ask three questions and they're gonna get progressively deeper. So the second question is if you uh, went to the doctor and they shared this um, uh, terrible news that you've had a, uh, that you have a, an ailment and that you'll live perfectly fine for the next five to 10 years, but you're going to you're gonna keel over at some point in the next five to 10 years. The question is, what would you do then? And a, a difference with the blog that you wrote, I don't let them have the money. It's what you do. Oh, okay. So, so it's very poignant. What would you do with the next five to 10 years if you knew sometime between the fifth year and the 10th year, uh, you're leaving the planet? What would you do? And it becomes very personal and people begin to think about the relationships that mean the most to them and other things that mean the most to them. They begin to reflect on their legacy and what they could accomplish in that shortened time frame. So it's a wonderful question. The third question goes deepest of all. And it's the 24 hour question. You ask, um, again, you're going to the doctor and the doctor lets you know that uh, you only have 24 hours left to live. The question is not what you would do at the time. The question is reflecting on all the things that you'd anticipated doing, all of the uh, the passions, the purposes, the meaningful things that you were gonna accomplish in your life, and they're all gone. What do, what do you miss? What did you miss? What did you not get to do? Who did you not get to be? And it's, it's, it's often in the answer to that third question in particular, that people share what really the meaning of money is, which is let's make these things happen. And it may be their, their young children that come to mind and you go, gosh, I would really miss. And so you build time for that in their life, much more time than they'd ever imagined.
Uh, it might be that, I mean, what we find is there are five things that typically come out. The first is family or relationship. The second is, um, I call it spirit, but it could be values, could be explicitly religious, could be explicitly secularly value oriented or somewhere in between spiritual practice. So the second one is actually uh, a, a deep personal thing. And the third is um, uh, creativity. So they might want to be doing what you're doing, which is creating these video blogs for people all over the world to see. And uh, and they're not doing it. They're holding themselves back or they they might uh, want to uh, write the great um, American novel or act in an independent film. So the fourth and fifth are the community, giving back to the community. That's the one we're trained for. But it's not at all what comes up first, not by any means. And then the fifth uh, surprised me, and this this started happening 20, 30 years ago when I started doing it, and that was people having something about planet Earth, and it could be just, I live in the city, I want to live in the country, or I want a place in the country, or vice versa, or it could be really concern already for uh, the planet. So those are the five things we see most often come up, and we deliver them within a matter of uh, months, if not uh, a few years. Wow. So how does a financial planner develop, uh, deliver these things to a client in such a short amount of time? Well, typically, as you can see, they're, they're much more personal. I mean, what we tend to focus on, what we've been trained to focus on is retirement, risk management, um, you know, portfolio construction, all of these things. And never taught to really, well, it, we've never taught really what fiduciary means. And fiduciary really means... Uh, putting your client's interests first. We've never been trained to discover what those client interests are, except in a very superficial way. So once you, but so we we think it's about having this grand retirement or having a certain dollar amount, but it's not about that at all. It's about spending time with my young kids, or it's about you know writing writing the great uh, American novel, and or playing jazz in the night in a nightclub once a week. So. They aren't that expensive. They don't cost that much, those things. They take some time, and that might you might freak out and go, oh, that's going to diminish their income. But the truth is, if you had 10 more hours a week for what you're passionate about, what you really love, you end up, what we've discovered is people end up working much more efficiently, vigorously, and passionately with their work. So it tends not to take uh, things away from the economics of their, their lives, but rather to add uh, many dimensions to their life. Wow. That's not really what we were all expecting when we decided to go into the financial services business, but it's very powerful. And I don't know if I shared on the blog or you read, but the first time I asked myself the three questions, what I missed was having children. Oh. And so I quickly went about that. It was like a light bulb moment for me. And it's it's amazing how those three questions can just be can put a spotlight on what really matters. But uh, one question I have for you is many financial planners and even clients themselves can feel uncomfortable having such talking about such personal uh, things, even in a first meeting. Um, how do you suggest that planners start on this journey? Well, of course, I've made the last 20, I, I sold my business more than 20 years ago. And, um, uh, and, I, uh, and, and the reason was I felt it was much more, I could contribute much more to society by training advisors how to do it. So we've trained advisors. So you can look on the program. We just added, Blair, this is very cool. Almost overnight, there's such creativity in, among the training community. We've shifted from an intimate five-day residential program out in, in some lovely setting to a Zoom call, like a Skype call. And we're do, so we're now doing intimate trainings with a dozen, 15 advisors uh, over four or five consecutive days through Zoom. And, uh, but, but here's, let's say that there was no George Kinder and no Kinder Institute there, how would you go if, there, if you didn't have the opportunity to do those trainings? Um, there are two things. I, I think the most important thing is listening. You know, you, you, you blogged about the three questions, but when you talk about the awkwardness of, um, of an advisor with a client and having that conversation, part of that awkwardness is that the client doesn't really expect, they may say they trust us, 
we think they trust us, but they don't trust the other the other folks out there. They don't trust financial advisors in general. So there's this underlying current of you're just there for the money and you'd better deliver or else in some way. And we've got that same kind of panicked response of we've got to deliver on the money. But the truth is that all of us, every person has dreams and every person would love to have a, a mentor, a, a great listener, um, a kind, someone who's kind and thoughtful and very professional and very knowledgeable about how to deliver what it is that we secretly long for into our lives. So clients would love to have that conversation. Of course, there's awkward moments as we go toward it, and there are lots of ways to prepare for that, whether it's through the website or email, setting things up, or how the office is structured at the beginning and how they're, what the expectations are. So there's lots of ways to set that up. But that, that awkwardness is something that we um, are much better at if we learn to listen. And, and listening listen well. And one of the thing, one of the books I've written, I know you were showing some of my books. Uh, I don't have the one that I would, I, I wrote a book on mindfulness. Mindfulness is listening inside yourself. That's really all it is. It's called, I call it inner listening. And the better we are at listening to our own uh, desires, confusions, neuroses, angers, frustrations, the better we are at noticing those things and bringing ourselves to peace around them the more we're able to be there with the client when they get anxious, which they're bound to, and particularly now, best thing now in the coronavirus crisis, this new depression that we're right on the edge of, is, um, is great listening skills. You, you might think it's how you've structured your portfolio, but boy, your, your client uh, will, will smell if there's, a, if there's anxiety inside of you, if you aren't really at peace with where you are. So, um, so it's those listening skills, I think, more than anything. Uh, that, that aid this. Yeah, that's really powerful. And so before life planning, you you were a financial planner yourself practicing. Um, how did this concept develop for you? Were you going about it the traditional way? Uh, is there a story there? Did it occur over time? How did life planning develop? Well, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a strange case. I mean, so it's, there is a story there, but I'm a really strange case because I, I, uh, I went to Harvard, as you probably know. I entered as a math major. Uh, because it was very easy for me. I was off the charts with math. And I was terrible at things like English. So what did I do? I went through economics. I, uh, and, and eventually I found myself to English literature. And I majored in English literature, which was a real <laughs> struggle for me. But I've ended up becoming a writer out of it all. And, uh, and in a similar way, when I left college, I was passionate about, I'd become passionate about the arts. So I was a painter. I was a, I loved to write poetry and I already had this mindfulness practice. So I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to practice inner listening to be a, a, a person with some depth. And I wanted to do art, art, art and poetry. But I couldn't find a single person who would pay me a penny for one of my meditations or a penny for one of my poems. So I had to get out and make a living like most of us do. <laughs> and so the story is really that my passion was somewhere else, but my skill was in the, uh, the mathematical area. So I took, I took that skill and applied it to first accounting and then financial planning. And then, and then ultimately investment advice became the, my main skill. Um, not that dissimilar from the, uh, the, uh, the, the way that you do do it as well, Blair. Um, so, uh, but because I had that secret passion and wasn't doing in my daily life what I really wanted to do, I would notice that, in fact, many of my clients felt the same way, that they were working a job. It was too long hours. They were getting tied down by their mortgage. Maybe they were getting tied down by the kids and they were feeling like they weren't able to be who they wanted to be. And I thought, wow, there's got to be a way of figuring this out. And that, that was really the beginning of it. it was, I was passionate about figuring out how do you become free and then helping others uh, do that. That's a wonderful story. I love that you were able to do something completely different than what you were passionate about and then combine it with your passions. So that's Thank yeah. you for sharing that with me. Yeah. Uh, well, I would love to sit here and talk to you all day. Um, it's been such a pleasure, George Kinder, having you on The Compound. 
we will put information um, below this post about where people can find out more about the Kinder Institute um, and about you and your blog and, and, and link to everything. Thank you so much, George Kinder, for being on The Compound. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Blair. It's been a pleasure. Bye.